budget cuts, graduation rates, student safety, curriculum standards, and after-school programs. Just some of the areas of concerns facing our education system and our community. Tonight, as the 2010-2011 school year begins, we sit down with HISD's Superintendent of Schools, Dr. Terry Greer, to hear his vision for our schools and how he plans to achieve it. I'm Ernie Manus, and this is Houston 8. The Houston Independent School District, or HISD, is the seventh largest public school system in the nation and the largest in Texas. It was established during the 1920s after the Texas legislature voted to separate schools and municipal governments. The system is responsible for more than 200,000 students in 298 schools, encompassing over 300 square miles. The district covers much of the greater Houston area, including the cities of Bel Air, West University Place, and Southside Place. HISD also takes students from parts of Missouri City, Jacinto City, Hunter's Creek Village, Piney Point Village, and a small portion of Pearland, in addition to students from unincorporated areas of Harris County. Hispanics make up the largest block of students at nearly 62%, followed by African Americans at 26.5% and whites accounting for just under 8% of HISD's total student body. Before achieving national recognition, President Lyndon B. Johnson taught with an HISD, as did First Lady Laura Bush. Edison Oberholzer, former HISD superintendent, went on to become the founder and first president of the University of Houston, while another former superintendent, Rod Page, became United States Secretary of Education. With each new administration, HISD refines its mission and makes changes. Some will support the changes, others may not. But in the end, the final verdict will be decided by the level of education our children receive. Joining us tonight is Dr. Terry Greer, Superintendent of Schools, Houston Independent School District. Welcome to the program. Oh, thank you. It's good to see you. First thing that's kind of surprising to me, when I told people that the superintendent was coming on the show, they said, oh, superintendents don't like to do that. And they fear having to answer questions. I'm curious why you think that is and why you don't fear it. Well, I, I think the public deserves to have their, their questions answered. And you know, it's interesting. Uh, we, as you said, serve over 200,000 students in 300 square miles. But most people don't really understand the magnitude of those numbers and they really are concerned about their children, their school, their situation and that's just human nature. And so I enjoy having the opportunity to meet and greet and to answer questions and to try to be as transparent as we can. We don't do everything right. We make some mistakes. But I like to hear from others, and I want to hear suggestions. I don't even mind hearing from critics. I think if, you don't always have to agree with them, but if you listen to them, it's a great opportunity to learn. Okay, first of all, what was attractive about coming to HISD? Frankly, the, the school board itself. Uh, HISD has had a long record of being a reform-minded district, but it's had good stability among its board. And I, I know when I was first contacted by the search firm that was looking for a superintendent here, uh, I said no. I, I said no several times. And, and finally, I, I just became curious, and, and I knew several of the former superintendents, and I thought, well, well, let's at least take a look, and I looked at the board's statement of values and beliefs, and the very first goal that the board has is basically says we have a primary goal, a goal of improved student academic performance. And when you look at what the board believes in, what the board values, uh, I thought, my goodness, I could have written that. So to me, really the attractive piece was the Board of Education's commitment to all children. Second, it has a history of a strong track record of community support. Not just business support, not just big business support, but small community support of our schools. Um, and third, I thought it would be a good fit. Uh, some of the very things that the Board was interested in in achieving and some of the problems they were interested in tackling were areas where it had some experience and had some success. So. Uh, after saying no a number of times, I agreed to, to come and meet with the board. 
And after that initial meeting, I, I called my wife before I could get back to the hotel, and I said, you just cannot believe um, how spectacularly dedicated uh, these board members are to the children of Houston. I said, this okay, is just we hear unusual. all of that, <clears throat> and then we look and we see a lot of problems in our school district. Mm -hmm. You hit the ground. What's the first thing you notice that needs tweaking or fixing or changing? Well, you know, the, the, one of the things that we saw was a lack of what, what I refer to as central standards. I'm a very big believer in site-based decision making. I like for principals and teachers to have a lot of freedom and flexibility to solve issues at the school level. But I, for example, saw in some of our high schools where they had 23, 24 advanced placement courses that were offered to students. But in other schools, there were only two or there were only three. And so my question was, was why? Well, we just let the principals decide, um, no. Uh, we're going to have a central standard. I've told all of our principals next year, you will offer a, a minimum of 10 advanced placement courses in your high schools. Two years from now, we're going to offer 15. Four years from now, we're going to offer 20. A child's education and the quality of that education is not going to be dictated by the zip code they live in here in Houston, Texas. And so we're going to give the principals and teachers great flexibility to decide how do we prepare our kids to get them ready for the rigors of advanced placement? How are we going to train our teachers so that they are ready and equipped to, to meet students uh, in advanced placement courses? You talk about these advanced placement <coughs> courses. We, of course, as always, we go to our Facebook to ask questions. Mm -hmm. and get some ideas beforehand. And one that came up a couple of times was HISD graduates coming into my college classroom underprepared. Uh, not just underprepared, without basic English skills, with zero knowledge in math. Talking about the advanced placement mm -hmm. seems like a far jump if we're not even teaching them to read or do math. Well, I think you've got a good point, and I think this, uh, the person who wrote the question does as well. Uh, we know one of our big challenges is for our kids to be college ready. And right now, we believe that only 15 to 20 percent of our seniors are ready to go to college and be successful. Right. And so that's what you heard me allude to a little bit earlier about having a different level of central standards that we hold teachers, principals, students, parents, and even the superintendent accountable for. Uh, because that's not acceptable. Uh, at the same time, uh, many times your critics who point a finger at you have three or four pointing back at themselves. And if you look at the college and university uh, graduation rate, uh, and all of these kids that go to the University of Houston or to any of the local colleges, and I just used U of H because we're on their campus, uh, your graduation rate's nothing to brag home, to call home about or to right. brag about. And, and, and I'll put our graduation rate up against any college or universities but here in the community. But outside of policy, just sure. in, in theory to talk, and not to, to talk about what we're doing here, yeah. but just to understand, I'm sure in classrooms are teachers, for the most part, who care, who are trying to make a difference, mm -hmm. who are trying to educate the students they have in front of them. But we see these out-of-control illiteracy rates and things like that happening all across our country. Mm -hmm. How do we change? I've heard some people say you can't tweak the system we have. You've got to throw it out and start from scratch. You know, I, think you, I think there's some truth to that. Oh, I know in Houston we're taking a bold approach to this problem. And we are working with a new teacher's project out of New York to come in and look at our human capital processes and procedures. And Explain what you mean by that. Basically, who do we recruit? Where do we recruit? How do we evaluate teachers? How often do we evaluate teachers? How do we reward teachers? We gave away $41 million in employee incentives last year for getting good test results. Right. But on the flip side of that nickel, what do we do with teachers who are not getting good results? After we help train them, if they still either will not or cannot meet our standards, what happens to that teacher? So one of the things that we're focusing on this coming year, and our board is really solidly behind, is this philosophy of putting a quality teacher in every classroom, having an exemplary principal leading every school. We have 40 new principals at HISD this year. All went through a rigorous evaluation and interview process. It was no more being hired because who you might know. It was based on uh, your attitude, your philosophy, your previous track record, uh, and how you responded to the situational kinds of questions that we ask you. You're going to be monitored very closely this year. Uh, we have decided that granting teachers term contracts or tenure is, is going to be something that's it's going to be much more difficult for a teacher to earn. Uh, we want our exemplary teachers to, to have term contracts or tenure with the district. 
And that's hard. I mean, because yeah. we're not out on witch hunts. We're not anti-teachers. We don't want to fight with the teachers' union. But I, I don't. I haven't met a parent yet, and there may be some there. I've not met one that when I've asked them, "Would you want your child in an average teacher's classroom?" And every answer I've received since I've been in Houston is no. You use the term quality teacher. Mm -hmm. I jotted it down when you said it. I saw you. How do you define the word quality? How do you know? I mean, if you look at this landscape that is Houston, mm -hmm. and you're going to be facing a lot of different challenges that mm -hmm. aren't simply the fact, did you lead the child correctly mm -hmm. through this curriculum, right. that's going to affect the child's results. So we how look, do you judge that? We look that? hard at outcome. We look hard at student test scores, and we get criticized for that. But this district's still been doing that for four years now. That's going to expand into our high schools. We've been looking at what we refer to as value-added scores, which means that if you and I started the fourth grade together, and you, you're a bright kid, so you're reading on the fifth grade level, the first day of the fourth grade. But I come to the fourth grade, and I'm in your class, but I'm only reading at the third grade level. So at the end of that year, because you're already at the fifth grade level, and you're in the fourth grade, your teacher has to differentiate between mine and your needs, and you, you need to be reading on at least the sixth grade level. You need to go at least one year. Now, I, on the other hand, that come in a year behind that's reading on the third grade level, hopefully we will, I will end the year on the fourth grade, third or fourth month level. I mm -hmm. need to catch up. Right. So there may need to be some additional tutoring from me. There may need to be some after-school work, some weekend work. Uh, but... I've got to grow more than a year. So when we talk about quality teachers, we're talking about a teacher who can differentiate instruction to the degree that all the children in that teacher's classroom grows at least one year academically for every year they're in, the school, they're in school. And that, to me, is, is quality teaching. Now, we'll have some teachers who you'll see kids grow two years, mm -hmm. three years in one. But unfortunately, we have teachers the children will come into their fourth grade classroom reading on the fourth grade level, but when they leave versus being on the fifth grade level, they have either not moved or they actually have regressed. Right. And that's not acceptable. That's, and if you, you don't just, frankly, you don't look at just one year of those results. You look at it over time. But if you've had a teacher that has year after year after year after year after year seen students that come into their class here, and they actually leave down here, we can't turn a blind eye to that. We, okay. We've got to have some staff training for them, and if that doesn't work, quite frankly, they have to go. But you are saying, just to clarify, it's beyond just hard score fact. You're looking at other things for these teachers? It's not just the it's, test it's grades. It's never just the test grades, but you know, it's always, also how do you manage your classroom? Mm -hmm. And you know, it has to do with your attendance. How, how frequently do you come to work late? Do you take a lot of Fridays a lot of Mondays off, you know, in the spring of the year. Uh, what is your relationship with your students? Uh, there's there's a, a variety of, 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 of different things that go into being a good teacher, but I want to know whether or not your kids have learned. I mean, you, I can like you, you can be the, the most likable teacher and love me to death, but if you've not taught me anything, Right. then you're missing part of the formula. Let's shift over to the students then. Sure. Students, as we know through studies, cannot learn if they're fearful, if they're coming from a rougher environment, if mm -hmm. they're malnourished. How much involved should the school district be, and I hate using the term, in raising our kids mm -hmm. as opposed to educating our kids? And where do you make yeah. the decision? It's, uh, I think it's, um, it's certainly it's interrelated. Uh, what we say to our principals and teachers is that, you know, there's some things in Houston, Texas that are given. School system's not going to change it. Uh, we can work to change it over time, but we're not going to change it today. Eighty percent of our students qualify for free or reduced lunch. That's a lot of children coming from impoverished backgrounds. Now, we know a lot of our kids are coming from single-family homes. You know, we know that. That's a given. We know that some of our kids grew up in neighborhoods where there's a gang influence. We know that's a given. Now, we can spend a lot of our energy trying to address some of those issues, which, you know, parental involvement is a biggie. We, we, we certainly do that. But we have a little control over a lot of what impacts children. But we have all the influence over what happens once you walk through that classroom door, once you walk through the front of the schoolhouse door until 
that time and the time the bell rings to dismiss you, then we have tremendous impact. We spend more time with you each day. We spend more time with you each week. Overall, we spend more time with you in a year than your parents do. Right. So we have an opportunity here that um, we, we really are talking a lot about in our new Apollo 20 schools, and we can talk about that yeah, later talk if you want. Yeah, about that program too. Uh, but we spend, we spend a lot of time in Apollo 20 talking about no excuses. There, there's no excuses. We want kids reading on grade level. We don't want anyone dropping out of school. We want every senior that graduates to be able to attend a college or university if they cho- so choose. We want them to have that skill set. And or we want them to, to have the skill set to where they can can be employed in a meaningful job, a job that pays a pension that has health uh, has health care. But getting back to one of your your, your first uh, uh, callers that there, or emailers that, that said, well, how about the kids that are not being prepared for college? Well, that's got to stop. Our kids have to become prepared. Uh, we have to prepare these kids for school or for a meaningful job. Before we get into talking about the Apollo program, mm-hmm. I'm curious, and I'm not sure everyone understands, what exactly the superintendent has jurisdiction over when it comes to the classroom day? And as I understand it, curriculum pretty much is outside of your arena. Correct? Well, not correct. This is correct and not You know, everything has a yes, but. Yes, <laughs> but. Uh, basically, the school superintendent and the school district is like the CEO of a, of a corporation. Uh, primarily, I, I do a, a, approve a lot of hiring, approve a lot of firing, uh, spend a lot of time planning, develop the budget that we send to the Board of Education, work with the business community to try to find support, additional funding for our schools, um, meet with a lot of groups, um, listen, 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 yeah. try to communicate. Um, but we have some control over the curriculum. Now, the state of Texas establishes our curricular frameworks, and you've seen some controversy. Right. I happen to think our, our state curriculum in Texas is too wide. I like to say it's 10 miles, miles wide to half an inch deep. I think we offer too many electives. If you look at some of the private schools in town that are affluent and serve affluent kids, if you look at some of the charter schools where 100% of their kids are going to college, their curriculum is much more narrow. The number of courses kids can take are, are much more limited, and but the courses are much deeper in terms of what you expect kids to be able to master and right. to know and to do academically. And so we have to adhere to the state curricular frameworks. The state adopts textbooks. Um, but we can be tougher on promotion standards. Uh, in HISD, we're driven a lot by the state tax test. Right. And, and it's very frustrating to me. It's very frustrating to some parents. You see a school that is an exemplary school, and they'll put the, the sign exemplary Texas school on the building. And yet in that school, you'll have 40% of the kids who don't read on grade level. We, we've seen schools yeah. that have moved from, moved from unacceptable to, to acceptable or recognized in, a, in the school year where you only have 25 or 30% of the kids reading on grade level on the Texas standards. We, we had a school this past school year where it moved from unacceptable to recognized status. Now remember, unacceptable, acceptable, recognized, and exemplary. Those are kind of the benchmarks in Texas. So we go from unacceptable to recognized. But yet on the Stanford 10 achievement test, which is a nationally norm reference test, the school, the percentage of kids reading on grade level went from 27 to 25 percent. So, so we 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 ought to start talking about uh, standards that are are greater than the Texas tax standards that we seem to be driven by here in HISD. So you fix the teachers mm-hmm. as much as you can. You try mm-hmm. and get those quality teachers in the Absolutely. classroom and the quality principals running the schools. Oh, sure. Is that where it stops? What else needs to happen to get these kids where we need them to be? Well, some of these kids, I believe, need more time. Uh, the, these are kids that can learn that they're further behind. And, you know, sometimes when you're talking about running a race, if, if you and I are racing and you're uh, ahead, uh, one of few things kind of has to happen. I either have to run a lot faster or I've got to get you to slow down. <laughs> now, I don't want our, our, our high-performing schools, and we've got some great schools here. We have some of the best schools in America right here in HISD. I don't want to see them slow down. I want to see them accelerate, too. So if they're going to accelerate 
then these kids that are back here behind, for them to start closing that racial achievement gap and to start catching up, then they need more time. They need a longer school day. They need more days in the school year. They need intensive tutoring during the school day. They need some of the remedies that we have implemented in our Apollo 20 schools, these nine schools, these five unacceptable middle schools and these four failing high schools uh, that we have come in and, and have worked to turn around. Those schools, they have to have more time. They have to have intense tutoring. Uh, a quality teacher, a quality principal goes without, without saying. Now, if we can find a way to get some strong parental involvement on top of that, that's the proverbial icing on the cake. Now, you don't control the parents. You control the teachers and the principals, but when it's outside of your arena, how do you get... And I understand it. I have sympathy for a lot of those parents out there, and it's a very tough economic time, mm -hmm. and they are pulled in a million different directions. How do you get them involved in the schools? Well, you know, we, we have to reach out. We have to try. We have to go to their homes. Uh, which we see a lot of our charter schools in town do, they'll actually go into the home and they'll, they'll go in and knock on doors and ask to come in. I want to talk about your, your child and trying to recruit your child to come to the charter and tell you that if you just, if you give them a chance, they're going to work with your ch child and their child, your child's going to be able to go to college. It's the type of hope that sometimes uh, some of our parents don't, don't have. And so we've got to find ways to reach out, not to be afraid, to try to engage our parents. We have to do a better job working through our faith communities because uh, our ministers, uh, our, uh, all, of, all of our faith leaders can help us in that regard uh, as a third party intermediary, if you will, to go to parents and say, look, uh, let's, let's talk. Uh, we, we will go to the churches. We will send people out to, to different venues to, to actively engage parents. Parental involvement is one of our, our goals for the year, and we have some training that we have planned for teachers and principals to try to help improve that area. How do you react when you hear a statement such as, and here's another one of those emails in, I can't get my child into any school that was decent. My zone school is horrible. When you hear those things, I know you have plans to try and sure. change that. But how do you react when you hear that? It breaks your heart. You know, I, you don't, I don't think any parent should have to send their child to a school that's not acceptable. And I'm talking about not acceptable from my standards, your standards, or their standards. Mm -hmm. And so we know we have work to do. And we, I promise you, we are working. We have hired some exemplary principals. We've hired the best core of new teachers that I think that we've hired here in a long time. Uh, we've reorganized our central office. I eliminated 414 central office employees. We thought we were a little top heavy and we use that money to help balance our budget because we were facing a 30 million dollar shortfall this year and so we are putting a lot of, of emphasis on on accountability uh, we're we're spending a lot of time talking with principals about what do you need but but again what we're pushing is, is a more rigorous curriculum quality teacher quality principal and holding people accountable for, for what kids learn or, in some cases, what they don't learn. fascinating thing that I think you did when you first came in was take down the razor wire. Yeah. I was shocked to hear we had it, first of all. And talk a little bit about the decision to do that. Well, a lot of our schools, depending on the neighborhood that the schools were located in, had rusty chain-link fences around the schools. And I mean literally all the way around. And many times that Bob, that chain link fence was uh, on top of it was adorned with either bob wire or sometimes razor wire. And basically when you rode by it, you thought, whoa, is this a reform school or is this a middle school or a high school or an elementary school? And you went to different parts of town and you didn't see anything like that. You saw nice wrought iron fencing that we'd had a policy here in the past that we were going to put up chain link fences and if the PTA wanted to upgrade, they could. Well, that's great. A lot of our PTAs could afford to upgrade, but guess what? Uh, a lot of our PTAs could have raised all the money they could have ever dreamed of raising and could not have upgraded the fencing. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that we said early on is that the barbed wire's got to come down. You know, I, I, I once asked a hard question, you are, are we trying to keep people out or are we, do we have such poor schools we're trying to keep kids in? Right. I mean, that gets back to what you were talking about, this parent was talking about earlier, about having unsatisfactory schools. So I thought it was a lot about image, and, and I thought yeah, it was the symbolism about... symbolism of it is wonderful. It, it's exactly. opening it up. 
So not only have we taken those bob wire fences down, we have started a, a fencing replacement program. And we can't do it at all at one time. We have so many schools. But we'll have a certain number of schools per year that uh, we will either randomly um, select or that schools are in just such bad shape the fencing needs to be replaced. Now, we can't put the wrought iron decorative fencing all the right way around some of these schools. We just can't afford to the way we've seen some schools in the past. But we certainly can put it down the front of the school or we can put it down the sides of the school and then behind it we can put in a, a black chain link fence that perhaps is plastic coated that, that again, it's about it, it's about projection. It, it, it has a lot to do with expectations and uh, it's, it is symbolic. It's very symbolic to our young people. Well, we are out of time. I hope that at the end of the school year, you'll come back and we'll be able to discuss where we've gone and what we did in this year. Well, I'll tell you, it's an exciting time. I've been in all nine of our Apollo 20 schools, those five middle and four high schools in the last two days. And the difference is just, I'm telling you, it is just, it's remarkable. So Good. come thank back you with for success stories for us at the end will. of the school year. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And that... It does it with us right now. Now, each week, we invite you to visit our home online at HoustonPBS.org. Simply click on the local programs bar, pick Houston 8, and you can join our online community. Read about the guests, learn more about the topic, share your thoughts and ideas, and even suggest questions that we might ask during upcoming episodes. Remember, information posted on our website may be used on air, so keep that in mind when submitting. That does it for us tonight. Until next time, I'm Ernie Manus. Thank you for joining us. Have a great week.